Would you please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy, and that is page 997 in your pew Bible. The blue book in front of you, if you want to follow along with us. 997, this is 1 Timothy. I'm going to start with verse 1. Chapter 1. Did I not say it? Yeah, I meant to say that. This letter is from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus, who gives us hope. I'm writing to Timothy, my true son in the faith. May God, the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord, give you grace, mercy, and peace. When I left for Macedonia, I urge you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those who are teaching, I'm sorry, whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussions or myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations. We don't need any of that. (laughs) Which don't help people live a life of faith in God. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. But some people have missed the whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they are talking about. You know any of those? I've met a few. I hope I'm not one of them. Even though they speak so confidently. Verse 8. We know that the law is good when used correctly. For the law was not intended for people who do what is right. It is for people who are lawless and rebellious. Who are ungodly and sinful who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their father and, or, or mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teachings that come from the glorious God. Good news entrusted to be by our blessed God. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme in the name of Christ. My insolence, I persecuted his people But God had mercy on me because I did it in ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with the faith and love that comes from Christ Jesus. Verse 15, this is very important. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them all. Uh, you know, the, the King James says it so wonderfully too. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. <laughs> so if Paul was the chief of sinners, where does that put me? You know, what's my ranking in this thing? And, you know, you could ask yourself the same thing. The Apostle Paul, really? The guy who wrote a lot of the New Testament and who gave his life for the gospel? Yeah, he, he considered himself the chief of sinners. I'd like to talk to you this morning uh, about... This, this sin problem that we seem to have. You know, anybody got one of those? Uh, why aren't their hands being raised? Do I have to take you out in the parking lot and stone you? Oh, okay, good. good. No, I won't do that because I, I can't cast stones. That's part of the rules. Anyway, this whole deal with sin. I hear, I've heard since I've been a Christian this concept or this thing brought down to us, this idea of original sin. Ever heard of that? We, we take it back to the garden, where the first thing God says, hey, be fruitful, multiply, have a great time, enjoy everything, but this one thing, don't do. Oh, really? What's that? Pen and paper. What would would be the first thing we shouldn't do? That's human nature, right? 
He gave us this free heart, this open mind to discover, to create, to do these wonderful things. This is our human condition. We have this unlimited potential created in the image of God. Would that being that God so lovingly and so carefully created, would it serve him or would it choose to go its own way? Let's find out. Let's give them everything that's perfect and wonderful and give them one rule. Now don't blame Adam and Eve for choosing the fruit that they shouldn't have had. We would have done the same thing. <laughs> don't be prideful. Don't point your finger at them. In, in Adam and Eve was the essence of all of us, all of creation. And for that sin, for disobeying God, they were cast out of the presence of God. They had, their lives were not like they could have been, and they slowly grew old, and their ultimate punishment was death. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I don't want to just leave you hanging with the negativity there. So every one of us was born a fresh, shiny, new human being. And we came up, and we just got bigger and stronger and handsomer, you know, and then just the hill. What do they call that when you're over the hill? And then gravity takes over, right? You can pay the doctor to lift you, but gravity will come back. Ask Zsa Zsa and Ava and all the Gabor people. It just happens, right? We have a destiny. It's called death. It wasn't supposed to be that way. Our bodies are wearing out. As good looking and handsome as you think I am, don't you? One or two of you. Okay, anyway, at least Barb did. But I'm not, if you hold up a picture of me in my 20s, and, and right now you'd say, who is that guy? Yeah, what happened? Gravity, old age, going over the hill. But the root cause of this is sin. We were born into sin, and we have a sin problem. Even on our best day, even at our most perfect, our most brilliant, we still had sin. We were born into it. Now, it's bad enough being born into it, but to give into it and be ruled by it is even worse. That's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, God introduced us to the law. The law flat out exposes it. You know, you first of all ought to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You ought to give everything to Him. You shouldn't worship anything or anyone else, ever. You should never take His name in vain. You've got to honor Him, and then honor your mother and father, and don't lie, don't cheat, don't swear, don't chew tobacco. Wait, that's not in the ten. That's somewhere else. Anyway, forget. Just see if you're awake. Anybody awake in here? Lori Coomer's awake. That's good enough for me. It's a rarity, but it's good enough for me. <laughs> But if you don't mind, I'd like to take you just a little bit deeper, right? We always call the original sin what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. But there was one before that. There was an angel so beautiful, perfect in all his ways. He was in charge of so much. His responsibility was so great. He was so beautiful. Some say he was just musical. When he walked around, he just made beautiful music. He was stunning. He was stellar. And he served God so well. And the other angels looked up to him and admired him. You may have heard of him. His name was Lucifer. And one day, he said, You know what? What's the reason I can't ascend this mountain What's the reason I could not sit on the throne of God? What's it? He exalted himself. The very first sin ever committed in the universe was pride. You ever consider that? Read Isaiah 14 and uh, Ezekiel 28, and you'll, you'll get more insight on that. Uh, Lucifer, who was created in perfection, knowing so much. Adam and Eve had to explore stuff. They were given that opportunity, right? But um, you know, Lucifer was created in the presence of God, always knowing in the, in the streets of heaven. Lucifer basically had no excuse. He got it into his mind that he could sit on the throne of God and that he could be worshipped as God. 
Why, oh why, I will never know. I wasn't there, and not a whole lot was written about it. But this we know about Lucifer. He's doomed. Hell was created for him and for all the angels who followed him. Yeah, he was persuasive enough. Some of the holy angels of God turned, and they followed him. So there was a rebellion in heaven before the rebellion in the garden. When and how? Got me. Not brilliant here. I'm just handsome, not brilliant. Anybody paying attention? Okay, yes. I will be, oh, see? Knocked over my communion. Oh, well, God knows. Forgive me. But uh, Paul is addressing the sin problem, right? He's telling Timothy, listen, Tim, you're a pastor. The church is a new thing. It's, it's not even 100 years old, yet this beautiful thing that Jesus died and rose again to give us. And you have a congregation, Tim, and here's my heart to you from God. I give it to you, Timothy, to pass this on. This church, the, when the body of Christ gets together, these blood-bought, blood-washed people who come from imperfect lives, who come from broken situations, who come out of sin to Christ, now what? Now what do we do? What's different? What, what has to happen? And what shouldn't happen? And Paul, even under the grace of God, he points out the law is helpful. The law is good. It shows us the standard. It shows us the bar, right? Here's the bar. This is God's standard. And people after people after people could never measure up. Not anybody, not Moses, not Abraham, not anybody from Moses on could ever measure up to that standard, that bar that he set. Nobody. So there was a blood sacrifice every year on the Day of Atonement. And they did this in the tabernacle and in the, the temples that followed. And all of a sudden, one day, somebody who breathes air and who walks the earth, a long-haired preacher from Nazareth, he measures up in every single way. Tempted in every way, yet without sin. And he did it so cool, people didn't actually realize what was going on at the time. But the father knew, <clears throat> and, and Lucifer knew too. I gotta get this guy. He tried tempting him. He tried messing with him. At the beginning of his ministry, he, tried to, he took him out in the wilderness and tried to make him turn stones into bread and worship him instead of God and, and blaspheming and all this stuff. But Jesus said, it is written, it is written, it is written. Beat him every time with the word of God because Jesus, like I keep saying, is so cool. <laughs> He's my man. He is my savior. He's everything. And then you fast forward uh, three and a half years into Jesus' ministry when Jesus is feeling the anguish and the pain and the rejection and the betrayal of every sin ever committed, past, present, and future for all time. It was dumped on him in that garden and he cried and he wept and he sweat like great drops of blood and he told the Father, if there's any way this could pass for me, and Satan was ne needling him and making him miserable and throwing stones spiritually at him and just trying to ruin him and turning one of his disciples to betray him. Satan was having a great day. All right, now I got him on the cross. All right, now he's dead. Yeah! Right? But he didn't, Satan did not realize that Jesus came to die. Jesus came to take this sin problem that nobody could overcome. He whipped it, and he whipped it good. He took it all the way to the cross, and he hung there, and he said, It is finished. He paid the price, paid in full. And when he rose again, Lucifer got it then. I was playing into his hands the whole time. I thought I was wiping him out. Uh, but here he is. He's alive and he's powerful. He's defeated death, hell, and the grave. My goose is cooked. So Satan is living. Lucifer is living on borrowed time. So the very first thing when he got his act together and they had a board meeting, okay, we got this problem now. It's called the church, right? Jesus bought and paid for them. The blood of Jesus covers them. Yeah, they're going to heaven. But they got a sin problem still. The church still has got these things that they got to deal with. My mission is to not let them deal with it. My mission is to make them the most messed up, screwed up Christians. To make them 
fight each other, to make them uh, listen to false teachings and false doctrines, to make them, oh, I don't even want to go to that church. I don't like those people. And divisions and evil. And even a Christian, I can get them with some besetting sins, things that they just can't quite overcome, like the pornography and the desires for this and that and the other. Hey, 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 that is what, um, don't look at me like that. This is not my plan. I'm in character here. Satan said this, not Tom Milne. says, don't look at me with those daggers in your eyes. Huh, you're scaring me. So we have the Apostle Paul. He's got a new mission. His first mission was wipe out the church. You know that didn't work out. <laughs> Rewrite, reboot. <laughs> now Jesus entered the picture. And now Paul sees the law, the prophets, everything. He sees it in Jesus. And Paul gets these magnificent revelations. And Paul gets taken up to heaven. He gets to see things he's not even allowed to talk about. And because of this vastness of his you know, knowledge and the things revealed to him, he has to have this thorn in his flesh that he carries to his dying day. But in the meantime, he's helping the Lord Jesus. He's one of the chief apostles that helps get this beautiful thing Yes, you beautiful people, the church, the blood-bought, blood-washed, redeemed saints of Almighty God sitting right here before me since that day when Jesus rose from the dead till the, uh, the Spirit on Pentecost came to this very day. Here we are. And guys, don't kid yourselves. You are under constant attack. All right? Murdering ideas will enter your head. Lustful ideas will enter your head. Prideful, arrogant ideas will enter into your soul. Uh, addictions. Yes, Christians can fight addictions. That doesn't mean you can't overcome them through the blood of Christ, but it is our struggle. Right? I think of hurting people. I heard this a while back. Hurting people hurt people. Do you know anybody who's got an anger problem? I bet you could rewind back to a day when someone hurt them so deeply, when they were betrayed so badly, when their heart was utterly broken and crushed. And sometimes these people, not all the time, they say, you know what? I am never letting anybody in my heart again I'm never subjecting myself to that pain ever again. Because every time I put my heart out there, somebody breaks it. So they suck it in. They build a wall around them, a tough exterior, hurting people. They hurt people. Is someone lashing out at you? Is someone being a real jerk to you? Is someone despising you and treating you badly and betraying you? Look back a few years and see where they're coming from. No, please. I'm not justifying what they do to you and what they've said to you. No, I'm not trying to say that. But Christ died for sinners. He did not buy, die for perfect people. That person needs set free. That person needs delivered. That person needs healed. And it comes first and foremost when the gospel enters their heart. I think the human condition, we want to change people's behavior. Stop acting like that. Stop talking like that. Stop voting that way. Stop, you know, see? Are you awake? Why do you say this? Why do you stand for Why? You know, it's a heart issue. I don't trust Jesus. I do not know him. All I know is I got this right now, and I got to make the best of what I got. And if that means lying, stealing, grabbing, killing, whatever, then I'm going to do it. That's the sin condition. That's the life you and I have been called out of. We have a new outlook on life. At least we should. Now you know this. What I was saying earlier, Satan hates Christians. Especially. I mean, he hates everybody across the board, but he really hates Christians. So Satan got this idea, uh, I can't beat the church because Jesus is just so powerful. His blood is so strong. And when they get together and pray, I can't even stand being in that room. I mean, he really can't. Like when we say in the name of Jesus, ah, that makes his skin crawl. He hates that. So we should just keep doing that. <laughs> but anyway, he says, well, here's what I'll do. I'm going to infiltrate. I'm going to join the church. And the more I get involved in that church, 
the more activities I can plan in the church, the more Jesus is moving out of it. So a long time ago, Satan decided to join the church. Do you think he succeeded in that at all? You look around and you see anything that has a cross or a, the word Christ in it that Christ is far from it. I mean, let alone the cults that claim they know Jesus, even though it's a different Jesus. Uh, there's, there's people who Jesus left a long time ago and they don't even notice. <laughs> that is so sad. This is our condition. This is our state right now. I mean, it's always been, but I think right now it's even worse than it has been. I think right now the dividing line of history is being drawn. As, as they say in downtown Pittsburgh, in or at? <laughs> are you for Jesus or are you for yourself? Do you want what's convenient? Do you want what's politically correct? You want equality? You want to be horizontal? You want to do all this stuff and all this work and forget about Jesus? Or do you want to seek him first? Do you want to look to him first? Do you want to worship him first? And then from the abundance of that beautiful relationship, then shine your light to this world. Then be the salt of the earth. Then share the gospel with all your heart, your mind, your soul. Don't you think that's a little more anointed, a little more blessed? Right now, I feel, you can disagree, that God is trying to wake up this church in different ways. You know, this, these outpourings with the college students, and, and there's churches, I see it, I see it, they're waking up. And, and there's international movements, people standing in Iran, do you hear me? risking their lives. They're standing up, waving Bibles. They might not have any more days to live once they get caught doing that. And uh, in, in Brazil, there's a revival. In Chile, there's a revival. In Vietnam, right now, there is a revival. In Russia, there are Christians standing up. In China, the Holy Spirit is moving and changing and transforming people today. And what's happening in Elwood City in Elport? He's got this beautiful gem called Elport Community Church. You guys are making the devil so mad because you love God. Your, your, your relationships revolve around God. You raise your children according to the word of God. You seek him. You look into his word. You scratch your head. I don't quite understand this. Or that doesn't. But you know what? Hey, the Holy Spirit's here. You got that good looking preacher in Elport. Maybe he can help straighten you out. Did I slip that one by you? I got one. Okay, good. <laughs> so, our sin problem. Pain. A lot of people are in sin because of pain. If you take a little kid and you beat them so savagely, or you violate them in, in many different ways, I don't want to get graphic, that kid grows up damaged. And a community reaches out to that damaged kid by the time they're teenagers and they reach out to ungodly behaviors, ungodly practices, because I never had community before. The people who I trusted did this to me and abused me, so they just surrender to the communities. I don't need to get too graphic here, do I? And we meet that person, that damaged person, and their behavior is not godly. Their behavior is not biblical, it is sin. Call it what it is. It's sin. I'll just call it lifestyles that people are embracing. God made me this way. <clears throat> he did not. This world has broken you. The devil has lied to you. And it has overwhelmed you. And you stepped into it. And now it is destroying you. I'll just flat out say this. Homosexuality destroys the human soul. It does. It's a curse. It's a sin. And to see people beyond their behavior and look at them as sinners who need saved, that's our job. Our job is not to string them up. Our job is not to ostracize them or call them names or, or you know, tie them to the back of the truck and drag them around just because we don't like their lifestyle or their, you know, no, that's not the mission of Christ. Jesus came to save sinners. Paul said, I am the chief one. Paul doesn't stutter. He doesn't shrink back. 
He calls sin what it is. Sin is behavior or attitudes or talk that separates you from God. God absolutely hates sin. You know why he hates sin? Because it's killing you. It kills your soul and it will eventually kill your body. And if you don't get it turned around, you'll be burning in hell. He came to solve that problem. You think God's a big cosmic meanie who wants to judge you and make your life miserable and cut you down in your prime and call you names? No, that's what the world is saying. That is a lie from the original liar. That behavior is a deception. It's a corruption. It's a perversion. It always has been and it always will. God hasn't changed his mind in the 2021s or the 23s or whatever. He's still the same. He hates sin because it's killing you. That is exactly why Jesus left glory, shed his glory and became a man. He confronted sin head on and he beat it. He beat it for the homosexual community. He beat it for the murderers. He beat it for the adulterers, for the blasphemers, for everyone. He beat it. They have a savior. He reaches out to the communities and he says, come, bring all your burdens, all your cares, all the torture, all the pain and the hurt and the betrayal and the neglect and the abuse. He's speaking, I am here. I know you're hurting. I know you've had it rough. You know, guys, when I was in that garden, crying my eyes out and sweating great drops of blood, when the whole thing of betrayal and, and hurt and pain fell on me, I feel your pain. I know your hurts. I know your alienation. I know, I get it. Jesus can say that every time. Come to me as you are. I will set you free. I will save you, I will heal you, and I will deliver you. Jesus can do that. He's doing it every day. I've had it done for me. You guys, can raise your hand if Jesus has done any of those things for you. That's why Satan hates you. You've got the blood of Jesus on you. You've got the word of Christ. You are dangerous, <laughs> right? But back to the community. The Spirit of God is reaching out to them, I believe. Well, we work with the Spirit to reach out to these people. I know this is a rough thing. I had, I had a good friend. I'll just, while I'm on this, he, he found out his grandson came out. And, and one thing his grandson said, Grandpa, do you think if I could have chose another way that, that I would embrace this lifestyle? He says, it makes me feel rotten. It makes me feel dirty. But this is who I am. This is how I was created. That's what that young 20-year-old man believes. Is that not a lie from the pit of hell? That's how he feels. That's why he goes on into the community. That's why he does what he does and waves the flag. And because he feels, I'm done. I got nothing to live for. This is who I am. This is my community. I'm going for it. And, and I've, I've been educated. The suicide rate among the community is very high. Just the mortality rate in general they usually don't live very long. Usually. Right? So it's not just us putting guilt trips on them. It's just a physical, spiritual reality. It separates you from God and it destroys your soul. God hates it. He calls it sin. Doesn't justify it. And he created no one that way. If you rewind that back, that kid was abused. That kid was neglected where that kid was led somewhere at a young, impressionable age and broken and busted. And now they're trying to grow up and justify all this in their own mind. And they can't. They're not sophisticated enough. They're not strong enough. And you have this sinful, evil, satanic community that says, come, come, come. And we, our job, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, is to say, no. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Alcoholics, drug addicts, people who are getting pulled out of prostitution and things like that, boy, do they got issues. They got issues. They got pain. They got hurt. 
We are not perfect. We've been through our sins. We had our deal, haven't we? And God brought us out. God washed us up. God has shown us a new and living way. God has shown us the love of Christ. We have to live in that and remain in that and shine that wherever we go. I mean, we can go out and kick over garbage cans and cause trouble and beat people on the head with our religious sticks. We can do that. It's been done. Not very effective. If we reach out with the love of God and prayer, we can maybe save a life or two. We can, we can maybe draw a young, confused person to Christ. Uh, there are people who are hard-hearted, hard-headed, and stiff necks who will not listen to you, who will not sit down with you and have a conversation in, in many regards. And I'm just talking about one situation. They just, they're angry at God. They hate religion. They don't want to hear about it. They do not want to hear about it. How do you talk to somebody like that? My advice, according to the scriptures, tell on them. God, this person won't listen. <laughs> they won't sit down with me. They won't talk to me. Yeah, go right to the source. They're being naughty. They're hurt. They're messed up. They're hard, hard, step neck. You know, like the whole nation of Israel was. <laughs> you, you know how to deal with this? Oh, yeah. You pray for them. And you know what? Oscar's going to know what I'm talking about. Back there, he's asleep. Did I put Oscar to sleep? Good dog, good dog. The Holy Spirit will unleash the hounds of heaven. Do you know what the hounds of heaven are? The Spirit of God starts moving on you. That's exactly what happened to me. God just started bothering me. He started disrupting my life. I had a plan. I was going to do this, that, and the other, and God kept interrupting my plans. God basically ruined my life. He did. And I thank God for that because my life was headed over a cliff at 90 miles an hour. But he saved me from that. You know, I'm, I'm, I got this plan. I'm going to graduate from high school. I'm going to start a rock band. I'm going to go on the road. We had a manager. We were going to go tour the East Coast. We had it all planned out and everything. And then God just started disrupting me and disrupting me. Every billboard, every other thing, my radio station kept, you know, all my rock music would go away and a preacher would come through. I opened up the glove compartment in my Volkswagen, which I never did. For one reason I did it, and it was stacked that thick full of gospel literature tracts. Who put those there? They would have had to have been in there for 10 years because they were like, <laughs> you know, when I opened it. And, and then my girlfriend gets saved and invites me to church. You know, that lady right there. And uh, he just kept messing with me until I was like, okay, God, you win. The hounds of heaven. Somebody was praying for me. I don't know who. I really don't, but I say thank you in eternity. They'll come up to me and say, ah, I was praying for you. And I'll say, thanks. But uh, <coughs> someone's praying for you. Can you be the person who's praying for somebody else? You never know what God will do. You will look and say, that guy got saved? Really? Oh, really, really, really. He's in the business of loving sinners and of saving sinners, of whom I am chief. Because Paul's in heaven right now, so that makes me the chief. Okay? <laughs> so... Sin is real. Sin is a problem. Sin kills you. Sin originated from the devil whose pride and arrogance set him on his path. He's going to drag everybody with him he can. And he is off the leash in these last days. He is trying to kill this world at a lightning speed, and he's trying to kill us. You have an enemy. He's got you in his sights. And the more you step out for Christ, he's going to try to take you down. I feel it every day. But I tell you what, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Yes, this world will bring you tribulation, but guess what Jesus said? Fear not, for I have overcome the world. Right? I could go on and on. Jesus won every battle you will ever face. And as long as you're looking at him, you won't sink in the storm. <laughs> I talked about that last week. So, armor up, helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, your, your loins girt about with truth, the feet with the gospel, preparation of the gospel, carrying that big old shield of faith and having the word of God and I'll just add in prayer. You, you suit up every day and you will walk with Jesus and you will overcome by the 
word of your testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Anybody say amen to that? So we're going to take communion.